Hello everyone, I'm Talon with Global Upside. Welcome to today's webinar, Ask the Experts, UK, Ireland, Netherlands, and Impact of Brexit. Our expert panelists will begin by addressing the top HR, payroll, and finance considerations when expanding into these countries, and will conclude with a question and answer session. Please enter your questions via the chat window at the bottom of your screen at any time. We'll be addressing questions that were submitted during the registration process first. If we are not able to address your question during our session, we will respond to you individually with an answer via email. The questions and answers are intended to be used for information and guidance purposes only and not for legal advice. We have uploaded a PDF version of the webinar slide deck, which can be accessed through the handouts pane during the webinar. We will also email you a copy of the slide deck and a recording of the webinar upon completion of the session. Now let's meet our panelists. I'd like to introduce Andrew Wilson, Vice President of Strategic Accounts at Global Upside. Andrew helps some of the world's leading companies tackle complex global HR, payroll, accounting, and compliance challenges. He is an English chartered accountant and has worked in London, Lagos, Caracas, and San Francisco. Prior to Global Upside, Andrew worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers, Oracle, and also consulted for companies like Nestle, P&G, Cola, and Colgate Palmolive. Now it's my pleasure to pass the time over to Andrew. Thank you, Talon. Uh, so I want to start off with uh, really why uh, companies have always regarded that uh, certainly in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, Ireland, Netherlands, and the UK are the top destinations in terms of US companies entering into Europe and establishing their operations. Uh, let me start with Ireland. Um, Ireland, back in the 80s, uh, did establish a policy where they lowered aggressively their corporate income tax rates to attract international com companies to their uh, country with the objective of expanding their employment base. So they lowered, uh, they had a special rate for free trade zones of 10% and they lowered their corporate tax rate to 12.5%. Um, this was very specifically targeted towards the US. Uh, and as you may know, the US, uh, the, the island has now become a top destination for uh, parking profits uh, in terms of US companies. In conjunction with this, they established the Industrial Development Authority, uh, which was their job creation arm. Um, and you will see IDA Island uh, has offices here around the United States, where they not only offered uh, tax incentives to actually establish your operations in Ireland, but they also um, actually gave you contributions to hiring employees there with the sole goal of increasing, uh, obviously, the employment rate in that country. With this, uh, Ireland became really uh, the jumping off point for many European countries uh, entering into Europe uh, and very much became where uh, European US, US companies would uh, translate, localize, and internationalize their products and services uh, to distribute throughout Europe. So. Uh, very much where if you are looking uh, really to that you need these types of services where uh, U.S. companies establish their base. The Netherlands uh, has always uh, been uh, for centuries uh, European's distribution hub. Rotterdam remains the largest port in Europe and uh, many products and, uh, are brought into the Netherlands and distributed throughout the continent. Very business friendly. Uh, they obviously have been trading with other nations for uh, many centuries, and uh, they are very efficient, very focused on uh, remaining kind of the, the hub in terms of, of product distribution throughout Europe. The population is 90% English speaking. They obviously do uh, really orientate themselves to welcoming US companies join and basically expand their operations in Europe. The UK uh, has always been Europe's financial capital. Uh, London is very much the where we've gone in terms of 
uh, really if you needed to uh, finance and expand or if you had associations with needing financial capital. Uh, very UK is most aligned with the US in terms of business practices. Uh, this very much came about after the Thatcher era where um, obviously um, there was a move away from unionization and very much towards business friendly operations. And today it still remains that the uh, the legal framework and the tax framework is very much um, oriented towards uh, similar uh, to what the U.S. system is. So very much um, the topic of the hour is, uh, which seems to change on an hourly basis uh, in the U.K. at the moment, uh, is what is really going to happen with Brexit. Um, as you know, uh, two years ago, the U.K. decided that uh, they were going to leave the European Union and uh, has spent the last two years trying to discern how that is going to happen. Uh, and it is still very unclear today how that is going to happen. Um, and very much the, uh, the sticking points have been around uh, whether it's going to be uh, a close union still with uh, the EU or is, or is not, and particularly in terms of the customs union and the, the, the ability to trade and move goods and services throughout Europe uh, is really where the, the concerns have come from. So this fear, uncertainty and doubt uh, has really affected trade prospects for the UK as a whole, particularly with obviously the EU, um, and has really led companies to think, rethink their strategy because many countries had the UK as their European hub uh, and as the uh, really as really where they employed the personnel, the, the main body of personnel, and then had uh, you know sales offices throughout Europe. So in in this, uh, the trend has been very much that um, you know companies that have used the UK um, have seriously thought over the last two years how to shift their resources, what are their future plans, what do they intend to do, um, and really what what are the implications long term. So at, at this point, obviously, uh, it's been going on for two years. There's definitely been this inertia about the fact that nobody can really decide what's going to happen. But every company's treated it from the perspective that the UK is going to leave and that they, if they want European operations to be in the EU, then they have to move them. Uh, so this has very much led to companies uh, have already moved their resources, have already changed their plans, and really, the UK has become standalone. Particularly affected, obviously, is immigration and customs checks. Uh, you will have seen uh, very much in the news about the fact that uh, if on March 29th there was no Brexit deal, then they expected all borders with the EU to be closed and that uh, there would be major problems getting in and out of the UK because nothing was decided. So supply chain and really how companies operate and do business from the UK with the rest of Europe um, it is creating a lot of uncertainty and, and people are very concerned about what is going to happen. And you will have seen today that uh, the UK has applied for a three month extension uh, to still try and figure out what's going on. Uh, this has also led to a lot of political division in uh, the UK. Uh, there's still the potential because Scotland actually voted to stay in the EU uh, and the UK voted to leave. Um, has very much led to that the, there still may be a breakup of what's going on in, uh, in uh, the UK and certain countries may, may leave the union um, and separate. Uh, right now, the intent seems to be that uh, the UK will still be aligned with the EU directives and uh, the labor laws and statutory requirements that operate in the EU, and we'll still have a close association. Uh, but until we get to the final decision, nobody really knows. So right now, in terms of Brexit, um, the you know, companies have made that decision. They've separated. Um, it still obviously is the third largest car economy in uh, Europe and so as a standalone country to go into um, it is still very attractive however um, obviously uh, as a jumping off point and uh, where you want to establish your European operations uh, there's very concerns about that and it is very much separated 
Right now, the preferred destinations uh, that companies have migrated to in terms of their European headquarters have been tended to be Ireland, Netherlands, and Germany. Um, Ireland, obviously, because of the uh, their pro uh, EU approach to uh, supporting companies with their distribution of product and services uh, from the localization internationalization standpoint, Netherlands from the distribution standpoint of products, and Germany from a banking perspective because most of the companies have actually uh, moved their banking operations there. So very much still up in the air, very much uh, uh, you know, nobody really knows what's going to happen in terms of whether it'll be another referendum or whether uh, it'll be a hard Brexit, a soft Brexit. And really, um, critical in all of this is obviously Ireland and Northern Ireland and what is going to happen there. So, uh, in terms of overall, uh, when you're going into these uh, uh, three countries, um, more from a, a general perspective, um, obviously they have um, some strict laws as to definitions of what's a contractor and what is not a contractor, uh, what is full-time employment, what is not full-time employment. Um, you'll see some discussion later about uh, some steps to, in Ireland to make this uh, you know, criminal if you don't employ people correctly. So really right now, um, yes, it, there's still the, the potential for an independent contractor. You have to be very cognizant of um, obviously, how many hours these people work for you and what is the nature of their work doing for you. Uh, there is the, also the concept of a professional employment organization or employee of record uh, where uh, companies like ourselves have legal entities in these countries where we can employ people on your behalf um, and they work for, for, the, for the, the PPO company. However, they're actually working at your direction as a U.S. company, so that is definitely a possibility. Um, there is a concept of a non-resident employer uh, where you actually can register in the country uh, to be a non-resident employer, which entitles you to hire people from the U.S. company. And then there is obviously incorporating a wholly owned subsidiary uh, and uh, entering into the country permanently. So those are your options. Um, in terms of employment contracts, um, obviously, uh, there's labor laws and statutory requirements in all of these countries. Uh, they're very onerous. Uh, they, there is no such concept of, uh, of an employment at will uh, because they are governed by uh, the labor laws in each of the countries. So there's very much dictates about work time regulations and how much time you're allowed to work, um, termination protections, amounts of severance, garden leaves, and things of that nature and the consequences of breaches. In terms of benefits, um, obviously in a lot, a lot of the countries there's statutory benefits such as the uh, national health insurance, pension plans, uh, things that are run by the state. There is still a possibility of supplemental benefits such as life insurance, disability insurance, private medical insurance, meal vouchers, daycare vouchers, Things that really attract and retain, uh, you know, employees to stay with your company uh, that can be procured and can be supported, and obviously that's the type of thing that we do for our clients. Payroll, uh, obviously, you have to have locally compliant payroll systems. Uh, the, the taxes vary in every specific country, so very much that um, you have to have a compliant system that is up to date from a payroll taxes perspective and a statutory benefits perspective. Uh, you obviously have to process and set up the payments for the payroll, the payroll taxes and statutory benefits and do the ongoing uh, quarterly and annual filings that are associated with them. Uh, we also provide uh, not only payroll systems, but high to retire services. So in terms of making sure that you onboard correct people correctly, uh, you're doing the immigration requirements correctly in terms of work permits um, and uh, what is required in terms of checking that they have the right to work in the country, um, and then the ongoing uh, benefits administration, hire to retire, and workforce visibility in terms of your HRIS systems as well as your payroll systems. So, uh, as I said, in terms of legal entity setup, uh, the possibilities here are the representative office or liaison office, which is typically 
short term, it's meant to be you're going into the country for one to three years. You're really exploring the market. You intend to know really um, only do research there. And so it's not meant to be uh, for a long term perspective. You can certainly open a branch. Uh, branches are still subject to income taxes. Uh, they do alleviate the possibility of having to do the annual compliance requirements from a company or perspective, although they have become less popular recently just because they uh, come with the downside of not having you, uh, entitling you to have um, employment law protections in the country. Wholly owned subsidiaries, um, are obviously 100% ownership that you would uh, incorporate yourselves and maintain. And then I've already discussed the non-resident employer requirements. Um, certain, of the, certain of the countries like um, Hol uh, the Netherlands do require you to have a local, um, local national as a resident director. Uh, so there are some requirements in terms of how you go about that. And certainly it's tricky from the perspective of making sure uh, you can move quickly getting the um, the registrations of the payroll taxes and statutory benefits. And um, without those, you really can't start employing people and uh, onboarding them for the payroll services. Statutory accounts depend on, uh, obviously, the size of the operation and, and how much uh, revenue and uh, expense you're occurring in the country. And then there are requirements for quarterly and annual VAT filings. Um, as well as annual income tax returns. So they are typically done in conjunction with your accounting services. So uh, <clears throat> topical things that are coming up uh, here in terms of specific focuses that uh, each of the countries are looking at. Uh, you'll see here that we've got the Employment Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, uh, which was recently introduced and really addressing around that whole independent contractor or temporary worker uh, philosophy. Uh, they are now making it a criminal offense uh, not to enter into um, employment contracts with employees if they consider that that's how they should be designated, um, uh, that they can't be classified as self-employed or independent contractors. So really is focusing in on uh, the whole definition of what is self-employment, much as you would have here in terms of whether an Uber or a Lyft driver is really self-employed or whether they are uh, basically work, should be classified as employees. So uh, bringing in some very onerous kind of provisions around that. Uh, redundancy packages in Ireland are, uh, have become very much more lucrative in terms of the amount of compensation, particularly if you've worked for longer than 12 months with a company. So very much focusing on the fact that it's like the entitlements when you do hire someone full time, enter into the employment agreement that, um, you know, to get out of those packages is going to really cost you, especially based on the extent of the uh, time they work with you. And then they're also introducing concepts of increasing uh, paid parental leave and annual leave in terms of the, uh, really addressing the issue of the work time uh, and uh, personal time relationship and the balance that you should be experiencing in your life in terms of how much you work. So the UK, uh, uh, obviously immigration right now is very much uh, topical in terms of what's going on. Um, and there are, you know, the UK is a very popular destination for EU citizens to actually live and work. And right now there is no work permit requirement. Um, there have introduced legislation uh, that will allow um, EU uh, citizens to have a settled status um, you know, entitlement uh, if they already are living working there, which does entitle them to stay indefinitely. However, there are still discussions about what the personal tax implications of that will will be and whether they will have entitlements to a lot of the state benefits. So. Right now, that is a very topical subject, but still very uncertain, very much dependent upon what's going on. Uh, they have introduced in a new tax year, starting on April 6, 2019, uh, that there is a, a requirement in terms of more detail around their payments to their status. Uh, and this is not only for full-time workers, but also temporary workers and people who are uh, deemed to be self-employed. Um, Obviously, national living wage, very much in line with the U.S., is being increased. 
Uh, this is actually higher than the U.S. at the moment. Um, and then there are uh, moves afoot in terms of increasing the entitlements, in terms of family-friendly policies, um, in terms of what's, uh, what really you're, you can look forward to in terms of parental leave and um, disability leave, things of that nature. Um, and, and, and then there's requirements in the UK that have been brought in around uh, publishing executive uh, pay gap and also gender pay gap um, considerations. So very topical in terms of uh, the whole debate about how much uh, uh, you know, the, the male and female workers are paid and what is the differences. In the Netherlands, uh, again, there's very much this focus on uh, short-term uh, contracts, fixed-term contracts, which can be a year renewable or indefinite contracts, uh, and how that definition is really derived at when you enter into the employment agreement, uh, because obviously what they want to focus on um, that that really employment is um, you know indefinite and shouldn't be a fixed-term renewable, uh, which is stopping a lot of the workers in terms of, the, of their of the amount they're paid, uh, that they are not entitled to so much as, as they used to be. Also, um, in terms of the, the work-life balance, again, uh, there's, there's legislation that has been announced where um, you know, workers can actually disconnect uh, from the employment environment and really are in this position where they, uh, they will not be required to respond to emails, phone calls, or messages from managers or employees outside work hours. Uh, so very much now legislating that this needs to happen. Um, the Dutch tax system is changing. There is a, uh, uh, many of you may have heard of the 30% ruling, which if you're, a, um, if you're an expat working in the Netherlands, you're allowed to have 30% of your taxes, 30% um, of your earnings not taxed. Um, that rule has been modified and changed. It's uh, right now. It's for up to eight years. It's been modified to uh, only for five years, and things are changing there. And again, um, there, there is more business-friendly, um, you know, focus in terms of attracting companies of changing the tax rates and lowering them for companies doing business in the Netherlands. So that's a summary of uh, highlights and things that we should be thinking about and what's happening in these different countries. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Talon, in terms of questions. All right, thanks, Andrew. That was a great overview. We are gonna move into the Q&A section of the webinar now. So let's just get started with the very first question. So what are the legal requirements to set up an entity in the UK? So setting up an entity in the UK, if you're a US company, very much, um, you know, the same requirements uh, as in most of the European countries. If you want to incorporate um, there, you are obviously uh, incorporating the legal entity as a wholly owned subsidiary or 100% uh, shareholder ownership um, from the U.S. company. So, uh, you obviously have the disclosures around uh, certificates of incorporation, articles, bylaws as well as um, you know, who are the authorized directors, and then of, often, obviously, you need to have the uh, information as it relates to the directors as they're uh, allowed to act on behalf of the company, and they are actually uh, you know, you know, legally um, how they can demonstrate that they reside in the US and are um, directors of the company. So typically, passports, uh, utility bills, and things of that nature. Um, and, and just demonstrate that. There also are uh, times where there is questions around, around ultimate benefit, beneficial ownership of the uh, company and, uh, and to know your customers, so they may require information around who are the shareholders of the company um, so they can see through the corporate bill and understand that. Next question, are there any virtual employer schemes available in the UK and or Ireland that would be that would enable smaller companies to team up in order to achieve economies of scale in sourcing employment benefits packages? Yeah, this is, um, I mean, obviously it's around pooling of the, uh, you know, of the, the companies and whether they can uh, get, uh, you know, private medical insurance or life insurance or disability insurance. Uh, it very much depends on the brokers and the, uh, and the, 
companies offering the the different schemes. Uh, so there are, are situations where they are uh, more of this pooling available. Uh, we work with some of the major brokers like Mercer, AG Gallagher, Lockton, um, who have access to schemes like this. So but very much something where it's like we would uh, definitely recommend working with uh, brokers that are able to facilitate uh, getting you access to such schemes. Next question, can you provide more information about contractors in Ireland? So as we uh, discussed in the Irish, uh, you know, the Ireland overview, um, this has become a very, uh, a, a, an area of focus where it's very hard to hire people as self-employed or independent contractors in Ireland. Uh, they are really trying to force you to enter into uh, employment contractors to treat the employees as a um, as a direct employee. Um, obviously, you have the option of the PEO and the employer of record where you could have them hired on your behalf. Um, and certainly as a U.S. company, uh, if you contract with someone, then obviously you, um, your legal jurisdiction is not there. But really, contractors in Ireland has become very difficult. And as we discussed, it can be a criminal offense if they are deemed by the government to be basically should have been treated as an employee. So the next question is, what type of tax obligations do companies in Ireland have? So very much uh, similar to all of the countries in the EU uh, in terms of the fact that the uh, uh, companies are, are all obviously have to register for income taxes and they basically have to file their income tax returns on a uh, annual basis. Uh, most companies, uh, if they don't need to um, uh, to generate revenue out of Ireland, um, that then they basically treat them as cost plus entities and they are uh, filing to say that they're going to pay income taxes on the amount that is uh, the markup percentage for the country. If you are looking to use Ireland as a, you know, a, a country where you want to um, you know, park profits uh, because of the uh, corporate tax rates there, uh, then obviously you generate revenue out of there. There is obviously the VAT that's, uh, that is charged and all of the um, goods and services that are really are, are, are generated out of there. Um, you have to file your quarterly and your, your annual VAT returns reporting accurately the uh, the revenue realized uh, uh, less the expenses of the, uh, the, the, the associate VAT. So that's from the indirect tax perspective. What are the key differences between an employee and a contractor in the UK, Ireland, and Netherlands? And then what laws pertain to these classifications? So as you saw in Ireland, the, the laws are changing. Uh, in all the countries, they're really trying to get away from, um, you know, the, this concept of self-employed or independent contractor uh, if you are working for a company. So there's very strict definitions in terms of the amount of time and the nature of work that you're allowed to do for the co companies. Uh, that is also where, uh, as we discussed in the Netherlands, where they have this concept of fixed-term contracts as opposed to um, in the indefinite contracts. So they're very tra they're trying to make it very difficult uh, for you to hire anyone as an independent contractor and, and prove the rules. So as it relates to the you know the, there are labor laws governing all of this. They're very complex. Um, if uh, obviously if you're willing to uh, hire the uh, the a person as a direct employee, uh, it's a lot obviously easier. You're just saying that you're taking a lot of more onerous commitments. But really hiring anyone as a contractor, um, especially if you intend eventually to do business in the country directly, uh, is very difficult. Okay. Is it possible for UK employees to continue working in the UK without a permit? I think that's uh, uh, obviously UK employees or UK citizens who have the right to work in the country do, do not need work permits. If we're talking about... Uh, Obviously, like U.S. citizens who are working in the U.K., they all require work permits. Um, they, they, if you incorporate a legal entity there, you're required to, uh, to obtain an immigration sponsorship license. Uh, 
um, that allows you to sponsor um, employees that basically working in the country. So uh, if, if uh, and the typically the uh, the work permits are associated with a company. However, they are transferable if you do obtain them. So if you incorporate a legal entity in the UK and how and obtain the immigration sponsorship license, you can transfer people who have valid work permits of a certain type uh, to come and work in the company. And we can certainly advise you on that. Okay, great. And next question, what documentation must be provided to confirm UK citizenship? And what are the, uh, the steps necessary to request a work permit? So obviously from a, a UK citizen standpoint, it, it is uh, uh, birth certificates, uh, British passports, uh, things of that nature. But obviously you have to demonstrate that uh, um, you were born and raised in the country or you have the right under the UK laws, uh, which really dates back to the Commonwealth that uh, certain people were entitled to UK citizenship who lived within the Commonwealth. Uh, as I said, in terms of the work permit uh, steps, uh, the company has to have the immigration sponsorship license, and then they can apply for a, a Type 2 uh, work permit on behalf of the employee, uh, submitting the, obviously their background in terms of their country of citizenship, um, job description, what, you know, what the entitlements are. And uh, there's a whole process in terms of whether uh, they have specialized talents or they're uh, a key employee. Um, to not have to advertise the position as being generally available to um, obviously to the to other applicants. So there's a whole process involved there. Certainly, again, we can advise you on what so to do that. Okay, great. And then one of our biggest questions um, is around VAT. Could you give us some insights into when and where it should be charged? <laughs> so. Uh, um, VAT obviously is charged uh, at, at the point of where, when the uh, uh, goods and services, the goods when the title passes or the services are being performed, um, and that's when that triggers it being charged, which obviously is reflected typically on a, a commercial invoice going to the client. Um, so that 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 really triggers the the event, and then it's reportable. Um, and then obviously when it's realized, then you have to pay it. Um, the Netherlands does have an interesting uh, angle there where they actually allow you to bring goods and services in the country and defer uh, payment of the VAT on those goods and services until uh, it's actually realized, be it in the Netherlands or in other European countries, uh, which is a great benefit because obviously you don't have uh, the immediate uh, burden of paying the VAT when you bring it into the country. Uh, uh, it's really when you dispute and sell it on to the end user. So, but varies country by country. The VAT laws are um, specific to the country, so therefore they change. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we, I mean, we do this type of work, uh, all, but also it's one of those types of things where you may need to have a VAT expert in the country. Okay. A Brexit question. So what aspect of Brexit will have the biggest impact on business? Uh, well, obviously, as we discussed previously, it's going to depend on what Brexit eventually becomes. Um, if if uh, it is a um, hard Brexit where you're saying that the um, customs and immigration between uh, the UK and the rest of Europe, uh, it forces the implementation of all of the requirements in terms of customs, duties and services. It impacts the flow of obviously the supply chain and the goods and services going into the UK as well as coming out of the UK. Um, that's going to be serious impact. Uh, obviously, from an immigration perspective, they will be totally separate. They have the usual things in terms of of being treated as a non-EU citizen for, for whatever they go. Um, but I, I think in, in all cases, really right now, it, it's like it, the UK would just be a completely separate country. It probably would have a similar arrangement with the uh, with the EU, such as Norway or Switzerland, uh, but it, it would be a separate country. Okay, thanks, Andrew. And then let's uh, end with one more Brexit question. So. 
Uh, what impact is Brexit going to have to local and expat employees in the Netherlands and the UK? <clears throat> so as we discussed in the UK, uh, they, they have uh, introduced into legislation past uh, these, this concept of settled status. Uh, so EU citizens who are currently residing in the UK uh, and working there uh, would have the uh, capability of staying in the country, working there legally uh, and participating. What effect that's going to have on, on taxes and benefits longer term is yet to be decided. Uh, in terms of uh, UK citizens working in the Netherlands, uh, still very much up in the air in terms of, uh, of what the eventual decision is, because if it is a situation where uh, it's a hard Brexit, then uh, they obviously would require work permits and, and it would impact their ability to work. If it's really a, a soft Brexit, then uh, there's going to be accommodations made. Um, if we end up with a referendum where they decide to stay in, then there'll be no change. So your options are all on the table at the moment. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your time. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. We had several more questions in queue that Andrew wasn't able to cover during the session. And so what we'll be doing is we will be emailing answers uh, to those questions individually by email. And we'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us at marketing at globalupside.com or give us a call at 408-913-9130. Thanks again for attending the webinar.